Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome to another video. I am Brittany Shawley, and this is my Miracles of Mind ministry. Today, I have invited some fellow course scholars with us today. We have Robert Perry and Emily Perry from the Circle of Atonement, and we have Tom Glaude, my partner in life and work. And I felt really inspired to bring us all together in conversation over a very important topic in A Course in Miracles. And this topic is being saviors or saviors of the world. And what does that even mean? And the more we personally look into the course, we find it in there all the time, all over the place. And so we really wanted to bring some voice to this and, and to really look into the course of what the course says about being saviors and saviors of the world. And so the place that I really wanted to start with this was to point to one question that we get asked in the use of terms. And in the use of terms, we are asked the question, are you ready to help me save the world yet? And when I first read that question and when I read it today, I take that very literally that we are being asked, are you ready yet to help me save the world? And so I feel like that question deserves an answer um, and it, it, an answer from each of us individually. But in order to answer that question properly, I do believe it is important for us to clarify and really understand what the A Course in Miracles means by saving, means by saviors, and to really define these terms that are used. So I would love to do that and dive into this together today. But one other sidestep before we get into the defining of these terms that are so very important for us to understand, I really wanted to highlight the fact that <clears throat> there seems to be two different approaches to this concept of saviors in the Of Course in Miracles community. And it appears that for decades, there has been one approach, one perspective. And that approach and perspective says that there's no one here, there's nothing happening, it's already over, so there's no one to save, nothing to save, there's nothing to do. And so ultimately, they kind of wipe a hand at this idea of saviors. You don't even hear it in the collective conversation. It's just not part of it. And so they just kind of rest in that space of observing. Whereas there is another approach, which is the one that I'm more inclined to lean into. And that approach is the one that says that we are here to like teach and to share and to give and to bless whatever it is le we've learned inside ourselves, whether we're miracle working or not we see the importance of giving and serving and blessing. And that's because we see God's child here and we see God's child that we want to give to. So it's not as much about not doing as much as it is doing as guided. And so I really wanted to kind of put that on the table, knowing that, you know, the Holy Spirit works through contrast. So perhaps just having them there can help each of us as individual course students to kind of choose, you know, what, what kind of perspective works for us. Um, but I really felt bringing multiple voices to this topic as well um, to kind of highlight that, that second approach, which isn't talked as, as, about as much um, kind of to the light and to the foreground of, of the conversation in our community today. So with that being said, thank you guys for being here and, and adding your voices to this conversation. I really appreciate it. Well, Thanks thank you so much us. for inviting us. Yeah. Absolutely. It's an honor to have you. I'd like to speak, if you don't mind, Brittany, Please, yeah, for a right. second to the thing you just ended on. Please. You know, I've been in the course community since the 80s, and I've watched, first of all, like how little attention is given to the term. Um, it's not there. I mean, a lot of people consult Ken Wapnick's glossary index. It's not a term with its own heading in the glossary index. Um, and then when you do see it used, um, it's mainly about how other people save us, not by giving salvation to us, but in some way they kick up our stuff inside of us so that we can look at it and let it go. Um, you know, they're kind of like great projection screens. They're great button pushers, um, but they don't have a holy role in actively giving us salvation. And so, you know, Emily and I recently have tried to put more focus on this in the past at The Circle. We've written articles about it. Um, but I know that um, to speak for both Emily and me, we're really hot on the term. We just think it's such a great concept and we're looking forward to talking to the two of you about it. Beautiful. Well, I think I can speak for Tom and say we're really hot on this topic too. And it's it really like close and like intimate to my heart. And and like for me 
personally, just to add another thought on this, like when, when Jesus came to me before the course did, he said he would give me everything I need to help save the world with him. Like this was the guidance that my brother and my heart and my mind said to me. So when I read that thing, like, are you ready to help me save the world yet? In the use of terms, you know, in the book, I was like, oh my God, like, how could this not be him? We just asked this. So it plays so much, not only into my understanding of the course, but how I live my life in relationship to the course and these principles. So it's so foundational that I'm, I'm aghast that it's not talked about more, but I'm grateful that we're talking about it more now. So, <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Um, the first question is, what can we save each other from and what can we not save each other from? And I just want to kind of get clear on those two different ideas of save. I'll open if you don't. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I, I love that question, Brittany. And I also think that we should maybe back up and start with what does it mean to be a savior in A Course in Miracles? Mm -hmm. And as I was preparing for this conversation today, I found this great quote from chapter 22. And it is those who would let illusions be lifted from their minds are this world's saviors, walking the world with their redeemer and carrying his message of hope and freedom and release from suffering to everyone who needs a miracle to save him. And so we could use this quote to garner a loose description of savior, which is someone who has allowed their own illusions to be lifted, who is walking the world with their redeemer, Holy Spirit, and who is carrying God's message of freedom and release to others. So you have enough healing of your own mind through walking the world with God and the Holy Spirit so that you can carry that freedom from illusions to others. And, and that's a big part of what the course means when it talks about savior. Beautiful. Thank you for opening with that. I have that quote if down. I, if, <clears throat> if I may add to that, um, I, I like to break things down to like simple things. So to me, to save someone is to provide something that's missing. So in this context, what we're providing is like information. So in the world, if somebody tells you that there's a traffic jam on the 101, they're saving you from going there and sitting in traffic. So in the same way, in salvation, when we give information or messages that are of God, we are saving others from believing things that oppose those messages from God, such as, you know, you're, that, that all your mistakes are really just mistakes and they're not sins. And so therefore, you already have forgiveness because there is correction to those mistakes. So when you provide this information to others, that's really all you're doing. You're giving thoughts to them that they are lacking internally inside their own psyche. And so by doing that, you're literally giving that message to the spirit in their mind so that the spirit in their mind can use it. Um, yeah, as... we're fans of simple definitions too. The, we did a, a little shorthand of what is saving and it's healing with love. Mm. And, and so if you wanted to get super simple with saving, you're healing someone else with your love. That's what saves them. And their gratitude for that in turn saves you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's also why the quote you said at the beginning ties so much into this, because if we are blocked up by our own judgments of others or condemnation of others or blame or fear or shame on, onto others, we have no room to love. And so the whole point is for us to purify and cleanse our own lens so that we are looking through the lens of love and only love. And therefore we're able to offer love and only love. And that love is what these people are calling for anyway. So it's, it's the answer that they're asking for. It's a way that we can offer salvation, offer help to those who are asking for help. And so I believe, yeah, it's, it's as simple as love. It's as simple as true ideas that, that we're offering to people. 
Yeah, it, in the course, there's a, a quote that says, um, the sick, those who are sick do not love themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they must uh, learn to love themselves to be healed. And so a person who saves someone from not loving themselves uh, does so by loving them and showing them that the person they don't love is wholly lovable to me. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus did to everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. We in our we had this central image in the workshop we did a few months ago that we're still still referencing between the two of us. And that is that when we give love to those that we are tasked with saving, it kind of goes into an inner reservoir. Um, and we lashed on to these two terms. One was reserve of strength. And reserve is a place you draw from. Um, and another one was a, a true and lasting sense of abundance. And that means abundance within. And the idea is that by giving love to those that we are meant to save, we're depositing into that reservoir, the reserve, um, the store. And because of that deposit in them, or that really, I think, accumulates over time, they can actually walk the world differently. They have a sense of strength, a sense of security, a sense of completeness that they can give from that they wouldn't have had with all those probably hundreds and thousands of deposits we made in their reservoir. And then the other side of this, uh, in the CE, our edition of the course, um, we left in one of the miracle principles that was about parenting. Mm. Um, and the idea there is that if parents don't give from their greater abundance to their children, um, it says they're deprived, and it says that um, their perception becomes distorted if they don't have that abundance making them abundant. And one of the things I've noticed over, over time is that their perception becomes distorted is basically the course's way of referring to mental illness. Mm. So it often calls or sometimes calls mental illness perceptual distortion. So if we don't, with parental love, fill in that reservoir inside the children, they don't have any place to give from and they become mentally ill. And it says that the sonship's relationships are impaired. And, and you can draw a lot from, from that one quote that it is talking specifically about parenting. So if we don't parent in such a way that it creates a reserve of love in our children, then they don't have that reserve. They go out and there's some form of perceptual distortion, mental illness, there, and then the relationships become impaired. And this is what we're seeing all around us right now. Our relationships are, are impaired in part because we haven't done enough for each other to put that reserve of love in the hearts of one another, which is what saves us. Yes. So beautiful. Amen. And I feel just to kind of be in, in alignment with what you guys are saying, like we've used the imagery before of like stacking boxes on the side of truth and spirit. So that we're constantly, every time we're adding like a, a new idea, a new inspired thought, a new extension or expression of love in some way, we're stacking boxes on the side of truth and faith. And then ultimately that there gets to be this point where there's this tipping point, right? Where you're able then to, okay, just remain in the presence of what the course calls the holy instant and be that presence and that beacon of love and light that we are created to be, right? And so at first, it's like a process, it's a training, it's a skill to get out of our own way to let love on through. But then eventually, that becomes the most natural thing. And I think that's why Jesus says at the beginning, too, in the principles that like miracles are natural. And, and that's what we're getting at. So it's miracles are natural. It's natural to save. It's natural to extend that love, you know, because mm -hmm. you're created by love. You know, that's the most natural thing. And uh, I, I think you guys are right. There's like this disconnect in relationships because we've almost... I've kind of said sometimes that I feel that it's like love has gotten chopped off at the knees, that it's like, okay, it's a great idea, <laughs> but it's not able to be expressed and extended and walked in this world. And then ultimately, yeah, just given away, you know, to everyone and everything. 
part of that is because we don't value the concept as much as we should of helping and healing one another. Um, we say this all the time at the circle that if spirituality is supposed to be the highest wisdom the world has to offer and spirituality is just about turning inward to what happens in your own mind and the extension piece of it is gone, then what else can happen but a breakdown of relationships? If we don't value that, then it's not going to happen. Right. And, and so this is why the savior concept that's all throughout the course is so important to infuse into the path through discussions like this. And I, I feel like to that point as well, like what we brought up at the beginning, like we can't have quality, holy, loving, connected relationships with each other if our belief system is that no one's here and nothing's happening. Like it's just impossible, right? Yeah. So that's why it's either like, you know, God's child is here and I'm God's child and so are you and you can join and be connected and have this loving exchange in our relationships or there's nothing happening and no one here. Like they, they there's no meeting place for that. And so I know I feel we're all over the place already, Brittany. I'm so sorry. I know I figured that would happen, <laughs> but, but it, but in the path of, if you take it on the two tracks, like there's the course track of there's no one to, there's no one out there. There's no world to save. So why should we be saviors? So already there's some defensiveness there. And then you take the savior concept of the, in the world, like secular, and, and it's been pathologized there too. Only you can save yourself. Don't have a savior complex. Don't have white knight syndrome. And so here we are collectively afraid to extend love and help to each other. And, and again, what else can result from that but the very dysfunction that we're seeing all around us? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Any other final thoughts on that? Oh, Tom, you're muted. I think I see you messaging there. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I may just touch on a couple points there. Um, so in the course, it says that uh, God's teachers, like from the quote that you read, that God's teachers are saviors, uh, the saviors of others because they let themselves be saved. And then you touched on the concept of um, the reflection, right? So in my personal experience, the my mom was the first person whom I decided to forgive wholly and to see as worthy of God's love fully and to see her as uh, God's child fully. And she didn't have to do anything for that. I did that. So that is literally what woke me up because by acknowledging her Christhood, I acknowledge my own. And that's how it's done. That's what the Course says is how it's done. In the, in the um, teacher's manual, it says that in the teaching learning situation, each one learns that giving and receiving are the same. And so... How this is not clear as the core teaching of A Course in Miracles is baffling, but it is the core. Recognize your brother as Christ, and you have correctly seen him as yourself, and that's how you get the experience of being Christ. There is no other way. So... Amen. That's that. <laughs> we say that all the time. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay, so that's beautiful, Tom. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Um, so the second half to the question that I asked earlier was what can we like what can we not save each other from? Which is also an important side of this topic. So we've talked a lot about how can we say what can we save each other from and now what can we not save each other from? You, me, go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, no, go ahead. I, I think that we all know that people tend to have, even the nicest people have very strong wills. And if they don't want to let something in, they're not going to let something in, um, even if what they're letting in is love. 
uh, you know, so you can't, you can't, people have their own agency. You can't make the choice for them. And so the course has this really nice balance where it says, okay, your job is to give them miracles, expressions of love. Um, and when you do, the gift is received, but there might be a time lag from when it's given and received to when it's accepted. So in the meantime, it goes into their treasure house, their storehouse, kind of like the reserve idea that Emily and I were talking about. Um, but it may not make an appreciable difference in their lives until they're in a place where they are ready to accept it. So I think the course has this nice way of, of threading the needle there. Right. Yes, I, I wanna bounce off that because I, I feel you're 100% right. And what I've noticed in regards to that, that if I'm like prayerful and I'm asking to be used and I'm asking to be helpful, I am. And so it's my duty to, to give what it is that I wanna receive at any given time. But like you're saying, not everyone is always fully ready for that. And so I've had times where I've given what I feel is everything to this person, but instead of them, like them receiving it and us having this mutually experienced this miracle or healing together, they are triggered by it and they get, take it personally and they get hurt by it. And they'll see responsibility as shame or blame instead of power or whatever it is. And they, they end up like disconnecting themselves from me in that moment. But what I I've learned through experiences with others is that I will always get the results of my thinking and they will always get the results of theirs. And what I'm giving to one another is God's child. And it's part of my role as a savior to trust that the Holy Spirit has received it, even if their ego intercedes and makes a muck of it and gets triggered by it and doesn't like it and blames the messenger. You know what I mean? And so my job as the savior is to remember who I'm speaking to and who I'm giving it to and to trust that. And what I've noticed is those people who get triggered by me in the moment, they'll go away, they'll live their life, they'll do whatever, months, sometimes years go by, and these people come back. And they go, oh my God, Brett, I understand what you were saying. Oh my God, Brett, this makes so much sense, and it's changed my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so I feel like a big part of that is when we give the gift to trust that the gift was given and it's received, and like you said, there might be a time delay which is what I've realized with a lot of people, but we need to stay in that trust. We can't be doubting ourselves and like, oh, maybe I didn't give it right. Oh, maybe this is my projection or, or maybe, maybe I didn't, you know, just doubt, get, doubt gets involved. And so we have to stay in the faith and stay in the trust that we've given it to the Holy Spirit and they will receive it when, when it's time for them to receive it. So we can't make anyone receive anything. And that's something in them, the truth in them, the Holy Spirit in them has already received it. And I, along those lines of what we can't save other people from, I, I'll just piggyback on what you were saying, Robert, that we, we can't save anyone else from their decision to choose the ego. But we have a model in Jesus because he says, I, if you want to be like me, then I can show you how. But if you're not ready, then I'll wait. And, and I feel like that's a, that's something that we can take on board and use in our own practice too, because you're never going to force someone into, into any kind of change. And so we can, we can take Jesus as our model too. I mean, he, he even says, I can't show you your own free will. I can't make a decision for you through tyranny. You don't teach freedom through tyranny. And so if he doesn't, if he can't help us, if he can't reach into our minds and change our will for us or change our heart for us, we can't do that for anyone else. And so as you're saying, Brittany, something in us just needs to keep loving and trust that the truth in them is letting it in on some level. Right. Which is also why the idea of him dying for our sins is so bonkers. Um because it's the the way the idea is taught is that he um, sort of canceled out our responsibility for dealing with our mistakes, and he didn't look around, you know, like it's been two thousand twenty four years, <laughs> and we're still a mess. So we can't save each other from the effects of our thoughts, but um, I mean. In, in a, on a sort of physical, 
in a physical way, in sometimes we can, like as parents, for example, we save our kids all the time, you know, but on a metaphysical level, that's when the, uh, you just can't do it. You can't decide for others. You can't take away their agency. Because right, that's what free will is, isn't it? Like our free will to choose, right? So like Jesus can offer us the miracles, but unless I choose it, I don't receive it. And I'm always reminded of the story in the Bible of like the rich man, right? So uh, Jesus, I want to follow you. And it's like, okay, we'll go give everything you have to the poor and then come follow me. And he's like, yeah, no, and he walks away. But Jesus didn't think that like, oh, well, I must not have given the miracle then. Instead, he proclaims the teaching to everyone so everyone can learn and everyone can be blessed and everybody can realize that, you know, it's a choice. Healing is a decision that each of us must make. And we as saviors can help bring that moment of decision and choice, I believe, closer to our brothers and sisters. But ultimately, we each individually must make that choice for ourselves. And we have to know that that's what we that's our true will. Yeah. We're very confused about yeah. what our true will is. We think, I think you mentioned sacrifice earlier that, oh, why should I save someone else? That feels like such a drag. Can't they just do it for themselves? There's, I think we have to get in touch with the fact that there are, there's a, a, a miracle impulse in us that just wants to give love and that there's also a pull of God in us that wants to be with God and the things of God. And that's our true will. And so when we're doing those things, expressing love, we are expressing our true will. And how can that be a sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So maybe that's a good like jumping point um, on to the next question because it ties into that. Um, because we, we've talked a little bit here about you know, the benefits and the effects of being a savior and giving, but I want to be more specific because, so the question is like, what benefit do we get from being a savior to others? Because yeah, being a savior to others does sound like a sacrifice to so many people. I mean, if we're focusing on saving others all the time, well, what about me, right? We're losing something in, in the mind of, of the ego. Um, so I would love to flesh this out. What are some of the benefits that we get from being saviors to each other? Well, uh, I think this is ultimately a huge topic. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tom's already touched on it in the whole idea that giving is receiving. And this is one of those things that is just, as you were saying, Tom, everywhere in the course. And it's one of those things that the course references as what it has already been saying. So there are places where, it's, where it says, you know, you've heard this said a hundred times, a hundred ways, and that means in these pages. Um, so that's a huge one. And that's something that is more and more in the last, you know, 20 years or so be, being borne out by social science research, that people have it in their minds that what will make them happiest is to shower themselves with time, attention, and goodies. But the data says what makes them happiest is giving. So that's huge. Um, as Emily was saying, there is this, this drive in us to, to give. Um, and I think from the course's standpoint, it's the same, ultimately, it doesn't look that way, but it's ultimately the same thing as the drive in us, the creative drive, the drive to produce something of value, the drive to make a difference in the world, the drive to contribute. I think all of those things ultimately come down to like a savior drive. And if you have a drive in you and you don't express it, it gets pent up, tension builds, frustration builds, and you don't even know why there's that deep level tension. Another thing that the course talks about is that through being a savior, we get to live in a world where everyone shines thanks on us. Which is really interesting. And I just, if you, if you don't mind, I want to read from a poem of Helen's because there's a few in her poetry, which she says she was channeling, even if she regarded that as coming from maybe not Jesus, but some deeper part of herself. Our, our observation is the teaching's the same. So she has a poem called The Silent Way. And she's, it, part of it says, for it is given you to trail the peace of God across the world without exception. Every child receives the gifts you bring. And men and women turn to you in thankfulness. With joy are you accepted everywhere. 
And elsewhere in that poem, it mentions the word savior. But the idea is we get to live in the world where men and women everywhere are turning to us in thankfulness. And how can that not change how we see ourselves? You should finish the poem and talk about what it says about savior at the end. It's really powerful. I don't have that in front of me. <laughs> it says the world would die without mm. its saviors. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pretty profound statement. Right. Um, to, to add to this, um, it, it's hard for me not to dr just draw on my own experience of it because it's the primary thing. But what I received through my commitment to say that, okay, like my life isn't for me. My life isn't to make me happier. My life is to give what I have to give. And that's how I will receive the great, the, the grandest life ever, whatever that looks like. So for me, that decision uh, e immediately gave me the benefits and, and the main one is just certainty of my role like i don't question it i haven't questioned it in 15 years i know my role because it's it's written on my heart to do right and so i discovered it by wanting to give it that's when i discovered it i didn't discover it before i decided to give and then it was clear. So it says in the course somewhere that in time, giving comes first, uh, but in, re in eternity, it happens simultaneously, the giving and receiving, something to that effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it gives you certainty. That's the point. Yes, beautiful. And I feel like what, and to what everyone is saying, I feel like that points to what I feel is one of the cornerstones of the teachings of Jesus in the Course, where he says to have, give all to all, right? So if we're talking about benefits, it's about having everything you think you need, right? Or, or want that ties with the abundance idea that you were talking about, Robert, that it's an inward abundance that you know you are one with God and God has given you everything. And because you've been given everything, you're compelled to give everything. And so it's this ever expanding energy of love, right? And so what goes along with that for me are just like all the fruits of the spirit, right? That like, as you give, and you give as God gives and you love as God loves and you see as God loves, you're going to receive back the joy and the peace and the consistency and the stability and your part to play in God's plan for salvation and everything that is amazing and good and beautiful. Like that's what we're told in A Course in Miracles and through our experiences that that's what God is, that God is love unconditionally without opposite. And so that becomes our lived experience here when we abide by his laws and his laws say to give and you will receive. And, and that to me is like the simplicity of salvation, that if we really want to talk about salvation and to save and be saved, it comes directly in accord with the law of giving. That's everything. Yeah, absolutely. I just tack on to that, that we just did this um, podcast on special function. Our, our, and I, and it talk, we talked about the, the general function, actually. Our, we all have a general function of extending forgiveness extending love and healing in the world and if you if you the course says that if you don't do your function it haunts you you this is similar to what robert was saying a minute ago it get you get depressed you there's an anxiety to it there's just a, a general malaise and we feel that but we don't associate that with our general function. We don't associate like, ah, I'm depressed. I, maybe I'm not giving love. Maybe I'm not giving enough love, but the course does make that connection. And so to your question, Brittany, about, well, why should we want to do this? Why should we be inspired to do this? Not only is there so much joy when you do, as you've been saying, and as you've been saying, Tom, there's a, a, a sadness when you don't and so we should be mindful of that as well. We get home by helping others home and that's our ultimate joy. And when we're not doing that, something in us knows it and is, is sad. It reminds me you of- You know, oh, I'm sorry. 
Um, I don't know if this is going to get covered by the other questions, but I did want to say that if anybody tells you that you are not to save others and not to save the world because there's no one out there and all that, like realize that what they're doing is they're trying to save you from trying to save the world. Therefore, disproving their whole concept of no one needing to be a savior. So just keep that in mind that you want to follow the course's teaching, not the comment section of your course group. And also, if, if for anyone who needs a line from the course to uh, back up what you're saying, Tom, there's there's a great one in chapter three. It says, in time, we exist for and with each other. In timelessness, we coexist with God. Yes. And so in time, we exist for and with each other. What is that? That's relationship. Exactly. Yeah. And I'll add a thought onto that, which is tying in like, the other side, which Jesus says, the only thing lacking in any situation is that which you have not given, right? So that yeah. that the ties in that that sacrifice idea that if you're feeling sacrifice and you're feeling loss or lack of any kind, it is because you have not given that which you are needing or wanting to receive. So, oh. poor Robert, I, I feel like this happened last time when we all got together, Robert. <laughs> never got a word in edgewise. that's not true i've been making long speeches the whole time <laughs> okay um, so I, I just want to echo what you said tom about the contradiction involved in saying there's no one out there to save while i'm trying to save you from your mistaken course views right right it's the classic performative contradiction and this is something that emily and i do talk about with those comment sections okay if you're saying there's nobody out there there's no world why are, are you talking? on this forum? Who are you talking, talking to? Who are you talking to? <laughs> exactly. That's amazing. Can I give an example of that line? Any it, it, so this is like this may sound like a dumb example, but it actually uh demonstrates that's that it's applicable to all things. Uh like 15 years ago, I was trying to learn a skill uh 3d modeling and there was this lack of tutorials uh out there to learn this very particular niche skill and i'm like, like what am i gonna do to learn this and then like suddenly it was like make a tutorial i'm like no no i need a tutorial so that i would know how to do it no make the tutorial and learn how to do it and then give it to others and I learned by giving it to others and not relying on it coming to me. Just an example mm -hmm. of that on a very like form level. Beautiful. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Well, we're kind of like half answering all of the questions because we're all so excited and so much to say. Um, but I think the next question that I want to lean into is I've asked the question, like, how exactly do we save others and how exactly do others save us? But I feel like we have talked a lot about that. So we can add more to that if we have more. But maybe we also want to answer that in context to like performing an outward role. Like sometimes people will say that it's just like holding the love in my mind and just like observing with love in my mind is enough. Right. And so can we maybe yeah, flesh out a little bit more, like how do exactly do we save others and, and, and have others save us, even though we have talked a lot about that, and in contrast and comparison with the whole, is there an outward role that has to come with saving? Well, I, I would like to draw out the others part, but, as you know, um, <laughs> because I, I was, for our workshop, I was trying to collect every reference to someone saving someone. Um, in the course, and I, you know, looked through the poems and looked through Helen's special messages and the supplements and came up with 104 references to someone saving someone else, like excluding the Holy Spirit saving, excluding false salvation of specialness as our Savior, you know, just a positive saving each other. And out of the 104 references, 60 were to other people as our Savior. 
which is really, it, it makes it the main concept on, on balance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think my understanding is there are three levels in which how they serve as our savior. Okay, one of them is we, we see them as our savior, um, which grants them a dignity and a worth. Um, it honors them. Uh, and just by the act of seeing them that way, what we find in some of the workbooks forgiveness exercises is it kind of unlocks something, I assume on an unconscious level in them, some deep holy place in them responds by shining salvation onto us. And so in that sense, they're serving as our savior without consciously knowing, okay? But we have to unlock it. That seems a little distant and abstract to me. I'm sure it's a very real thing. Then the second level is where they uh, save us because we have saved them to some measure, even in a small amount. And they just naturally in some way express gratitude. Um, and that gratitude is a form of love. That gratitude, the Course says, it, in that gratitude, they see in us more than we see, which is a pretty cool idea. They've been the beneficiary of the goodness in us, and they appreciate it more than we do. So their gratitude saves us. Uh, there's a great line where the Course says, the sick um, who ask for love, something need love, and in their joy for, uh, for being given love, they shine with holy thanks. Mm -hmm. So they, them shining their holy thanks on us is them acting as our savior. And then, so that's kind of a responsive thing. And again, we're unlocking that role in them with our act of being their savior. And the third level is they actually have a calling in life to save us something they should, they, they're being called to actively do as a role in life. Um, although again, the Course says, we can be a force in unlocking that in them. Like the more deposits we make in that reservoir inside them, the more they can stand up, stand tall, and take up their own personal calling, which involves saving us. That's beautiful. What's What's, Speaking to me about that is what Jesus says in the Course, that either we see our brothers as our savior or we're judging our brothers. I mean, there's a better sentence and quote than what I just said, but that's basically what he's saying. And so I, I feel like what you're leaning into there is that if we, in our minds, see them as our savior, it gives the space and the openness for them to be our savior. And, and that also ties in with, I, I believe, the idea of like, when we heal, we're not healed alone, right? We need each other. This is for and with one another. I feel like that's how we can hold each other accountable to God's laws and ways and truth and thoughts is by knowing that we are saviors to each other. And I feel like what that does too, is it gets us out of the paradigm of idol tree. That there's this one person who knows more than we do. And we got to go to this one person to learn everything. Instead, it goes, well, wait a minute. I'm just teaching as I learn, like I'm just giving as I've received. And I want to empower you to teach as you're learning and to give as you receive. And in that we're equals in that we are shared saviors to each other. And so I feel like that's, yeah, it starts, I guess, still our decision to see them as savior instead of judge, but then that opens up the space for them to truly help us. And, and that, that has been my experience too. It comes back. And that's yeah, really the whole on. relationship model. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and I'll just add to that, Brittany, I agree with all that you've just said. If, if you are judging someone else, they feel that whether you're voicing it or not. And so in response to that, how are they going to, to be, they're going to be closed and how can they save you? How can they shine love on you if they're in that place? Well, part of the reason why they're in that place is because of how you were with them. And so here's this idea of the way that the savior complex kicks off is we see something in them beyond their body. That's We see the holiness in them. And because we see that something in them opens up and they're more loving to us. And that's how the relationship works. That's how that's actually God's plan for salvation. That's how, how it works here. It's how we heal one another. And as we do that, the world is healed. Um, can I just say one thing also about your specific question about what is it that we do in the world with other people to save them? And um, 
I want to say something about that because that's, that is the idea that we are planting love in the hearts of other people that Robert and I have latched on to this, this dual idea of our love can prepare them for the harshness of the world. This goes back to the idea of planting love in children. It, my son is graduating from high school here in a couple of weeks and I'm just like reflecting did, did did I love him enough so that when he goes out in the world and is faced with people who who won't love him like that, will he have that reserve? And or will the world just like if you don't have that reserve, the harshness of the world, the unlovingness of the world can just strip it out of you and then you become harsh. But if you have that well of love, then you're able to see the love in the other person, regardless of how they're being towards you. So I'm thinking, does he have that much love in him to face the world? And then there's also a repair factor. So there's a, there's a savior. You, when you save someone else, you can re, you can prepare their heart for the harshness of the world. But then there's a repair factor too, where, where someone who has been damaged by the world if you give them enough of your love, you can heal that in them. And, and we have, again, we're suspicious of that. We've pathologized that. We've made it unsafe. But it's actually one of the most beautiful things that we can do for one another in the world. And, and it feels like more of that approach to loving one another if that got in the world, we would have a different world. Part of the reason why we have so much dysfunction here is because we're so afraid of one another. Beautiful. That's, that's reminding me of like one of my favorite um, lessons and I have it written down. So like, I, I wanna read it for a second, just the line from it. Um, if I can come across it in my little notes quickly enough here, but I think it ties to that idea of like doing in the world. Um, there it is. So the lesson 353, where he says my, that we are to say, like, this is our prayer. Like my eyes, my tongue, my hands, my feet today have but one purpose to be given Christ to use, to bless the world with miracles. Like, if that's not like a proclamation yeah. of being a savior of the world, like, I don't know what is, but that to me is also saying that give him your hands, your eyes, your tongue, your body, your beingness. So that he can use you as a vessel of God's love to extend, to deposit that, that love into others and extend that love to others. And, and I feel like that's, that's how we bring it into the world is by being used. And sometimes that might look like a touch on someone's shoulder or someone's hand or whatnot. You know, that might just be a gaze with the eyes with no words at all. It might be particular words that I say to someone, right? So the way that we save or the way that others save us can look a little bit different in form, but when we're mm. allowing all of our beingness to be used by Christ to bless the world, to bless our brothers and sisters, you better believe that we will be used and both we will be used to bless and, and save others and others will be used to bless and save us. And that to me is how we start encroaching upon the real world, right? The kingdom has come, you know? And it, and, and it shows up in those holy exchanges of healing that is given and received between us. But we must know that this is our, I mean, it's the end of the lessons, right? Like we got a lot of training before we get to the end of the lessons, but this is the goal, right? This is the goal to be used in such complete and whole ways while we're walking. It's the path. end of the lessons, but from the very beginning, he's defining what a miracle is in A Course in Miracles. Mm -hmm. And a miracle is an expression of love to another person that heals them and that in turn heals you. And that's your savior concept right there. Can I say something super controversial? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a miracle is more than a change of mind. <laughs> Legit. Let's well, just like, get, what Emily just said. It's an expression of love. That's what Exactly. Yeah. So people can define things the way they want, but really um, it's definitely more than just changing my mind. It's changing my mind and then correcting. Act to correct. Right. Listen, learn, yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's well. Go ahead, Robert. Your turn. 
<laughs> what you see over the last nearly 50 years since the course was published is we kind of redefine things that are a bet that are interpersonal as being really yeah. just about us there we redefine them as intrapersonal so miracles which the course defines six times as expressions of love quote unquote um X we redefine meaning that. from from in to out yeah yeah we all know what an expression of love is you know it's it's you know something that if you're if you're in this culture you know what it means um, you don't have to be a course. In fact, if you're a course student, you kind of lose the awareness of what it means. And we've done the same thing with other things. We've done the same thing with Savior, right? It's just, it happens in my mind. You aren't really my Savior. I'm not really your Savior. Um, we've done the same thing with holy relationships. It doesn't really take two. Most everyone in the course agrees that it just takes one. Um, and so, you know, I think we've we've redefined things in the course to fit this view of it's only about my mind. And one thing I'm appreciating about talking to the two of you today is like you're saying exactly the stuff that Emily and I are always saying. And it's just refreshing to hear people saying this about A Course in Miracles. It's right there in the book. And yet the collective narrative has headed off in a whole different direction. Yeah. Well, that's why it like, it got hijacked, right? And and I feel like that's why conversations like this are so important and, and quite frankly necessary. And I feel like this ties in with the miracle principle that says that miracles undo the past in the present and thus release the future. So to me, that's what like the intent of these conversations for. Like we all make mistakes. We're all human. Like we're all learning how to listen to inner guidance. We're all learning how to trust. And so it's it's a process. But if we can really look at the course and really see what it says, instead of taking what other teachers or humans have said and really look to the course, then what starts to happen is we start to see witnesses to what's actually being said in the course. And then those witnesses are confirming everything that we're seeing in the course and it becomes a self-fulfilling thing that just expands into the experience that God is love and so am I and so are we. Right. And, and to me, that's essential is that it's, it's a, we, it's not a singular one. Like to me, oneness doesn't mean singular one. Oneness is united. We're united as God's sons and God's children. The and sum I, of all. Creation. Yeah. Say it. Yeah. In what number is, infinite. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh my goodness. Well, think, who, what do we know? Right. Guys? <laughs> well, we don't. Well, <laughs> right? I think it's a big book. It's a big book. There's a lot of, language is hard to track and so people have leaned on the narrative out there they've leaned on particular influential teachers and what happens is we underestimate the ability of people to have a document like this and be totally immersed in it but not pay attention to what it says instead pay attention to a kind of cultural narrative that is very different right exactly Exactly. And that's why I think it's okay to like remind people that like you don't need to understand it. You don't need to believe it. You don't need to like it. But when it says to do something, do what it says. When it tells you to apply these lessons, apply what it says. When it tells you to assign study periods, assign study periods. When it says take the Holy Spirit as your teacher, take the Holy Spirit as your teacher and just practice and try it on. Right. And I feel like that's where kind of like what you were saying with your story, Tom, that if you feel like you don't understand something, then ask what you can give in order to understand. And I feel like that's the same thing that happened to me with these YouTube videos. It was like, oh my gosh, like I, I need help to integrate this. I need help to understand this. I need help to deepen this. What do I do? And it's like, do YouTube videos. It's like, what are you talking about? That's the opposite of what I think I'm asking. But it was exactly what I needed. Because when we allow ourselves just even that small willingness to be used and to allow whatever we've just maybe read from the course to come through us in some way, it's like, it shocks me sometimes because then you become like witness to something greater than yourself flowing through you and it increases your faith. It increases your yeah. faith in what we're learning and what we're teaching. And to me, faith is the container in the domain of miracles and understanding. So yeah, faith is what I hope we inspire today. So I want to give a, just a thought to everybody. So anytime you experience that something's missing, like what you just said, um, you can, you can, um, ask yourself, what can I give, um, to change 
the missingness of it, right? And you're going to find that sometimes um, you can't do it, but you're going to find that sometimes you will get you will receive something to give, whether it's a word, whether it's a, you know, uh, an idea, whatever it is, just try it, try, get, so the, the thought is the fastest way to have something is to have, help someone else to have it. Mm -hmm. Because that's also the test of whether you want it. Mm -hmm. Is it worthy of sharing it with your, with all your brothers? If it's worthy to be shared with all your brothers, then you do want it. And if you don't want to share it, is it really what you want? Right. In terms of the whole active issue that you brought up, Brittany, like, do we actively carry this out? I think there is there is a really consistent teaching in the course along the lines of Lesson 353, where each day you're being sent opportunities to give miracles and that's how you carry out your role as savior. And then there's a whole other dimension, which has to do with that special function topic that Emily mentioned, mm -hmm. where the Holy Spirit has some perfect sort of uh, observation or insight into your particular gifts. And out of seeing exactly what your real gifts are, um, rather than what you may think they are, he fashions this special function and then you go through a process, presumably, of finding out what it is, growing up to be able to carry it out, and devoting more and more and more of your life to it. So I think that's a whole other additional model. There's the giving miracles every day, which is bedrock. Um, and there's also, as a savior, we're given a particular role based on what we best can do. And people, right. particular people, to save. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you finished with that. Maybe that means part two video because I would love to talk about special functions so much. I feel like that has been part of what's helped me to heal and to know myself and to stay consistent is not only extending the love every day, but becoming open to what my special function is, receiving it and doing it and learn as I do. Um, and so that's a whole other category, but you guys, there's so much more I can ask, but I know we're at the top of the hour. So I'm just going to say, are there any final thoughts of wisdom, things we want to tie up before any final offerings of anything before we kind of conclude for this video today? I, I'll I think, say. Go, go ahead, Emily. Yeah. It, it, when you hear the word savior, it feels very, very big. And I think one thing that everyone needs to know is that this is for everyone. This is a response. Everyone is called to the role of loving other people, healing the hearts of other people so that their gratitude in turn heals you. That's God's plan for saving the world. That's what's going to heal the world. And this is something that Jesus himself devoted his life to. He even says, I didn't give you my merit. I give you my love. I gave you my love. Um, and that is what heals. So if Jesus is our uh, teacher, if this is our path, then why wouldn't we do what the path says, as you're saying, Brittany, but follow the model of the teacher who gave us this path and, and, and save one another and to feel like that's a holy thing that's a sacred thing that there's nothing more worthy that we could give our lives to it's the thing that he gave his life to and to to hold it up like that and not be so afraid of it Amen. just to piggyback on that a tiny bit there is a quote where jesus says um give me a second um, that the holy relationship is a means of saving time and that it is so to the reader of A Course in Miracles um, that this is your path your that your path is different not in purpose but in means and then that the holy relationship is a means of saving time that's the premise okay so we save each other because we're collapsing time 
And that's the special sort of uh, function and special path that we have taken um, that includes our brothers. That isn't just our own salvation. And that's the speed up that he says is most potent. Absolutely. I would say, uh, let's just stop pathologizing this idea. I think we pathologize it in sort of modern self-help pop psychology, like Emily mentioned, savior complex and white knight syndrome and enabler, right? I think we pathologize it in A Course in Miracles context. If there's nobody out there, um, let's, let's challenge that and let's realize, I think this is how life works, right? Just like we damage each other, we save each other. Right. It happens all the time. It's part of life. You don't get that well of love full of inner abundance in you out of which you can give on your own. You just don't get it. So you need someone to give it to you. Yes. Amen. Someone who, to whom you can give as well. Yes. Yeah. Oh. I feel like everything we've said is so beautiful and so whole. And I feel like perhaps my final contribution here is I want to read one of the small little prayers that he gives us in one of the lessons, lesson 266, I think. And I think it'll tie everything in. So let me just read this prayer and then we can say our, our final farewells. But in lesson 266, Jesus says, Father, you gave me all your sons to be my saviors and my counselors in sight, the bearers of your holy voice to me. In them are you reflected, and in them does Christ look back upon me from myself. Let not your son forget your holy name. Let not your son forget his holy source. Let not your son forget his name is yours. This day we enter into paradise, calling upon God's name and our own, acknowledging ourself in each of us, united in the holy love of God. How many saviors God has given us? How can we lose the way to him when he has filled the world with those who point to him and given us the sight to look on them. Beautiful. Beautiful. My goodness. So you guys, thank you three for joining me today. Thank you everyone who's watching. You, if you found value in this, please say yes below and say yes if below if you want to see more videos of this sort and always like and subscribe because that does help to bring these videos and these messages to him it's meant for. Thank you everyone for being here. I love you. I love you guys. Thank you for joining. Love you guys. Important topic. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, Thank thanks you. so much for having us. Thanks. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.